Welcome to Walk About the Galaxy, the escapist astronomy podcast. Get escapist. It? Yeah. Where the science is universal, the opinions are personal, and the sponsor is mathematical. Oh. Nice. We are, we are Strange Charm and Top the Astro Quarks, also known as Josh Caldwell, Addy Dove, and Jim Cooney, coming to you from the Walkabout Studios at the University of Central Florida. Jim. Yeah. Hamiltonian or Lagrangian. Mm-hmm. Well, this is like a preview to the mathematical uh, sponsor. Sponsor. Is it? Is it? Maybe. So, th- this one, yeah, this one that's only... That's also mathematical. <laughs> what? It's all- Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian or Lagrangian. Right, right, that's it's what not, I'm saying. It's that's not a- just a musical. <laughs> that is true. I have not the seen it. The, the, plus, the, the Tony musical. award-winning <laughs> Lagrangian. Lagrangian, sorry, yeah. I wish. I wish, because that's the one I'm going with. You're going to go hip-hop, Lagrangian, Lagrangian. is the next uh, mm-hmm. musical? So what musical. what are awesome. Hamiltonian and Lagrangian anyway? So Hamiltonian and Lagrangian the are... <laughs> Hamiltonian's the musical. Mm-hmm. Um, these are methods of, of doing mechanics, physics. Right, so uh, when you first learn physics, you do something like Newton's laws, F equals M A. When you first learn physics, you cry. Yeah, yeah. No, you say, oh, you "This say, is amazing!" This is amazing. If you've taken it from Josh Caldwell, Eddie Dove, or Jim Cooney. Yes. Right. Um, when you first learn it, you learn Newton's laws, and then and then you get a little bit fancy toward the uh, end of the semester, and you learn about conservation laws, conservation of energy, and conservation of momentum and angular momentum, which we'll talk about today, a little bit later in the oh, program. Hold on, everybody. Spoiler <laughs> alert. Good Excellent. stuff coming. <laughs> um, but I'll tell you, the reason I choose Lagrangian is, so, so that's how I, you know, that's that's how you learn physics, and I thought that was great. And then when you take a, an upper Advanced. level mechanics class, mm-hmm. you learn that you can do the same things in that's these really different, fancy, more abstract ways. Yeah. And the first one you learn is, is the Lagrangian uh, formulation of mechanics. And I thought that was the bee's It was knees. kind of mind-blowing. It was mind-blowing because the all of these knees. really, co- th- you know, you can solve any problem you want with F equals MA, but it turns out to be really any complicated. problem. Yeah. Well, in theory. In your life. Marital problems. <laughs> That's right. Financial problems. Yeah, yeah, anything. F, got equals a F equals MA it right the hell away. I yeah. got a problem with my loan payments. <laughs> That's a great slogan. F equals MA it right the, the hell away. <laughs> the solution to all your problems. Yeah. Um, but it turns out that you know that, that that that's really hard to do in complicated systems. But the Lagrangian method of, of doing mechanics is it turns out it makes many problems very easy to do. Yeah, and I thought that was beautiful. You're a purist because what happened in the meantime, me being older than you, <laughs> is I I saw the transformation brought about by computers, mm. and computers don't care. They don't give a crap that f equals ma is complicated. It is true. It is true. And they're just like. F equals MA, no problem. I can do that. What yeah. do I need to do? A calculation for every millisecond? Okay, I will do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's probably true. In modern physics and everything, or in physics today, every problem that can be solved with these methods has been solved, basically. So everything is now has to be solved numerically, Crazy. and it doesn't really matter how you do it numerically. Anyway. But anyway, I thought it was beautiful. So that's why I'm picking uh, Hamiltonian mechanics, by the way, also beautiful. But eh. you learn that after. And so yeah. I wasn't as blown away by that as I was by Lagrangian, so I'm going with Lagrangian. Lagrangian. All right, Addie. Great. Also, names. Uh-huh. I'm curious to see if you get them. That's why I blacked out okay. parts of it. Ripley or Connor? Know what I'm talking about? I think you're talking about Aliens and Terminator? Yay! <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, it's very arbitrary, though. I don't know why. It is also, yeah. I don't know why. I'm going to go Ripley. Ellen Ripley. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love her. Yeah, she's pretty badass. Yeah. But then, so uh, Amelia Clark, play, Clark plays uh, Sarah Connor in the newer uh, in the newer Terminators. That's right. She was and in some Terminator thing. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's the And who's she? She's the uh, Daenerys Targaryen. And oh. who, Mother played, of Dragons. who played the original Sarah Connor? Linda Carter? Hamilton. Oh! <laughs> That's true. There we go. Yeah. Look at these connections. So who's Lagrange? Who do <laughs> <laughs> Stacy Lagrange? Stacy Lagrange <laughs> was the first person cast in Alien the child versus star Predator. Star, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, today, yeah. I think I think I'm gonna have to go. Yeah, I like my choice. Today we're going to talk about uh, some cool observational advances and seeing planets form and planets around other stars. A new study about the history of our own solar system using statistics, but we won't hold that against them. Mm-hmm. Looking at asteroids. We might. Or we might, <laughs> as relics of uh, ancient collisions. Uh, plus, we'll give a primer on orbital mechanics for all the future space jockeys out there, and an orbital historical trivia, orbital slash historical. 
trivia. Speaking of orbital mechanics, this episode of Walk About the Galaxy is brought to you by the Tisserand Parameter. Ooh. <laughs> oh, jeez. When you're walking about the solar system, those gravitational bullies like Jupiter and Saturn may scramble your orbital elements so you don't know whether you're coming or going, periapsing, or climbing the ascending node. But you can always hang your hat and your identity on the Tisserand Parameter. This simple combination of A, E, and I might not spell a Scrabble word, but it does let you keep track of comets and asteroids after they've had their orbits scrambled by Jove. <laughs> the Tisserand parameter. Know yours and don't leave your home planet without it. It's important to keep it close. That that was a very... Uh, I don't there know was a lot going on for. in there. Yeah, that's a, a, a not a very well-known... Uh, sponsor today. That's why they're sponsoring us they're to get more. To get so, yeah. Yeah. They're trying to get one more well known, ready to go big time. Yeah, yeah. like okay, now it's time to punch it up. <laughs> yeah, call walk about. So what, yeah, call, walk gotta, about. call walk about. Get your, I don't get care your what it costs. <laughs> We're going to sponsor an episode, and it's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Tisserand Primer is this funny. So it has to do, and it relates somewhat to one of our science topics today. Mm-hmm. Everything relates somewhat to one of our science topics today. We can you can put them together. It's We're like six degrees of mm-hmm. Kevin Bacon. You can six degrees of you can put it together. Science. You can make the link. Linda Hamilton, Hamiltonian. There you go. But how many degrees Sarah of Connor. separation do you need to have a Tisserand parameter of? I'm just ah, yeah. so the t- so the problem is when uh, comets and asteroids, but comets especially, mm-hmm. uh, they have close encounters with Jupiter, and Jupiter gives their orbits a big kick. And they get a kick out of it. They get a kick out of it. And what happens is while the comet is near Jupiter, Jupiter's gravity is more important than the sun's gravity. Mm -hmm. And so it does this dance with Jupiter and then, but it's generally not captured. So it goes flying off from Jupiter from the sun's perspective in kind of a random direction. Right. And so now it's on some new orbit around the sun that from to the casual bystander of which (laughs) there are many. (laughs) Yeah seems to have nothing to do with the original orbit. But the Tisserand parameter shows a way to kind of connect those dots together. Hmm. And it just combines the orbital elements, the shape and the size and the orientation of the orbit in such a way that you get a number. And it turns out that when uh, Jupiter or Saturn or whomever scrambles the orbit of the object, that combination of numbers doesn't change very much. Right. So then mm-hmm. it's so that mm-hmm. it's not truly a constant like a Hamiltonian or some one of these conserved quantities, but it's kind of conserved mostly. Right. It's good for like horseshoes so, conserved. So not rigorously conserved, but right. But uh, conserved. lazily conserved. Really? There you That's go. the opposite of rigorously <laughs> conserved. So it's lazily conserved, and then it, it helps you identify. Oh, this comet's that comet from before. Right. Uh, and um, so. That ties into one of these things about orbital mechanics and how orbits get changed by encounters with things. Mm -hmm. But before we delve into all of that goodness, Mm -hmm. have either of you, has either of you seen Ant-Man and the Wasp? No. Haven't seen it. No. Have you? No. So that's end conversation. conversation. (laughs) Good. I enjoyed the first Ant-Man. I did too. Pretty fun. So I didn't see it in theaters because I was like, "Ah, I don't know. But then I saw it on a plane one time and I was like, this movie's great. So first of all, it's got Paul Rudd, who's awesome. I love Paul Rudd. He's from Kansas City. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. He's awesome. He has not aged a day in 20 years. He wears a Kansas City. That's true. He wears a KC hat a lot of times. And he and a bunch of other guys that are from Kansas City started this uh, baseball charity tournament thing that they do once a year. It's oh, called the boy. Big Slick. So he's both Kansas and baseball. Oh, so gosh. Addy, Addy really likes this guy. Don't tell me he also likes the moon. He probably does. <laughs> yeah. He probably and does. rockets. Yeah. I bet he does. Who doesn't like rockets? Um, cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, so we're going to we're gonna see it. We're yes. Gonna see it, soon. Sure. it does have to do with quantum physics. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the first one, uh, it went really off the... Yeah, I think we talked about this a little author, bit. Did we? Yeah. Some other yeah, they, time. They lo- this one, though, is going to be totally fun. This one, this sure, one should be perfect. Use the same physics <laughs> well, that they used I mean, in the first one. There was a big article in the New York Times about how they had scientists on board to do really? all sorts of quantum physics. But having, you know, I, I'm truly not tooting my own horn here. Uh-huh. I'm instead <laughs> uh, inflating my own balloon or something. I don't know. Why. But having been a uh, on the consulting side for one movie once, uh, they do want to come and hear you talk about that stuff, but then yeah. they go do whatever the hell they want to do. Yeah. And I'm sure they're saying, oh, we're doing small stuff. Let's talk to some quantum physicists about what 
the universe is like on the small scale. And then maybe some of that conversation inspired some special effects guys to put some extra sparkles right. in some right. scene or something like that. Yeah. Um, but mm -hmm. ultimately, you're making a superhero movie about a guy who can turn in, can miniaturize himself. Yeah. Can he maximize himself too? Well, I've, I've seen, seen the trailers. It looked like he was he huge in a few of the scenes. Himself. Yeah. He'd get big. There but. was a movie, Attack of the 50 Foot Woman. And then they reap from the 50s. Mm -hmm. That was when they were doing all these sort of nuclear mutation mm -hmm. disaster movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was a remake with Daryl Hannah. Oh, yeah. Like in the 80s yeah. or something. It might have been a TV movie. I feel like I know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> That's good because yeah. I'm using English words, complete <laughs> sentences. But yeah. anyway. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, I have not seen that. All right. Movie. Any of you seen any movies? We saw Mr. Rogers. Yeah. Not the science fiction Will related. You be my neighbor. But it's not a we cried. Movie. Yeah, we'll be honest. I think everyone in the theater. Uh, Addie was cried. there with me in the theater, and uh, yeah, I did not see a draw. I was I was bawling like a baby. Wow, <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> okay, it was like uh, mostly they... good tears. Yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah, mean, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, it also I, made me sad. But yeah, yeah. It was, I'm it was, an easy uh, weeper at movies. Oh, yeah, yeah you'd have been I crying. sometimes am too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I like save there, it for movies. Once or twice, I was life. sobbing. Like I was like, uh oh, in I have that to movie? be careful. Which one? Oh. I haven't seen that movie yet. Oh, okay. But uh, there have been times when I've been in movies and I'm like, all of a sudden realize, you know, like just the tears are running uh -huh. down. And then I think, if I'm not careful, I'm going to be going <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. audibly in the yeah. movie theater. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but it's hard to stop that. I, I do that. Oh, that yes. makes your throat really hurt when you try and stop the. Uh, mm -hmm. the uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, we, get me out of a movie theater. I'm just a jerk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Save Cold, it all up. Dead heart. <laughs> Except in right. movies. Yes. Except in movies. Yeah. Um, we it's we the did magic though. Of the theater. We did though. Um, see a dramatic event recently. All of us when we did an escape room. Did hence, you guys? Hence the escapist podcast. Yeah. Ooh. Because we collectively and our associated quirks. Bottom quirk. Bottom quirk and in. unnamed quirks. And guest quirks. Guest quirks. Escaped, uh, helped us escape the, what was it? The Cold, Cold War, War crisis. Yeah, Cold we War We defused crisis. a bomb. Mm -hmm. Speaking of movies. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, we were talking which about. Which we were before we started talking about the escape room. Mm -hmm. Well, we were talking about uh, Daryl Hannah and the Cold War yes, era uh, movies and nuclearization and stuff like that. Uh-huh. There you go. Uh-huh. And I'm in, uh, I as you know, as all our listeners know, ad nauseum, that I had a, a brief appearance in Deep Impact. What? <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> it's almost like we've 20, done that before. <laughs> 20 years ago. Uh, but if you look me up on IMDb, I'm also credited as being in another movie hmm. with a speaking part, which is about to be released uh, for oh, yeah. free viewing everywhere on, on YouTube. YouTube. Oh. Fishbowl, oh, a yes. comedy about the tragedy of real life. I think. <laughs> I think that's the tagline. You think line. that's the tagline or you think that's what it's about? That's kind of what it's about. And it's, yeah. the tagline has those Something has like the that. words comedy yeah, and yeah. tragedy and life. Okay. Yeah. Fishbowl. Fishbowl. Produ uh, it's a um, awesome pr uh, premise awesome production. Awesome premise productions. Yes. Uh, check it out. August 1st, 2018, available on YouTube. That's nice. many, many days away. It is for us. For, for us. us. But it, probably not for the listeners. That's true. Yeah. A million things for us to do in those Between days, and, and each then. day will pass in the blink of an eye. So. Panic! Okay. Yeah. I'm done now. All right. So, uh, orbits. So, I mentioned They're pretty great. how the Tisserand parameter kind of helps you keep track of a comet when its mm -hmm. orbit gets scrambled by mm -hmm. Jupiter or whatever orbit scrambling thing it happens to have an encounter with. If it's an exoplanet, it's a different it would large be a different, planet. Yeah. So we could go on a list for all time of mm -hmm. the things that could mm -hmm. do that. But we take this same phenomena to our advantage when we send probes to other planets, mm -hmm. except for Mars. We don't. Mars, we Usually. always do a tra direct trajectory. But for other planets, we use gra what are called gravity assists. Mm -hmm. And it's the same idea. The spacecraft, you uh, say, okay, I'm going to send Cassini to Saturn. And on the way, it's going to fly by Jupiter. Mm -hmm. And when it's close to Jupiter... It doesn't care about the sun anymore. It does some dance with Jupiter, and it comes out on a new orbit uh, when it's now far away from Jupiter, that it only cares about the sun gravitationally anymore. It's on a new orbit around the sun mm -hmm. that, I can't, won't say magically, physically, physically. <laughs> has more energy and is on the right course to it Saturn. It stole energy from Jupiter. That's right. That's right. How did he do yeah. it? 
And it did steal it. It did. It didn't borrow it. Every time yeah. we do a flyby, it's you steal a little it. bit of energy from the planet That's right. flying That's right. by. But the beautiful thing is, Jupiter doesn't care. Jupiter's got a Jupiter's lot of energy. Jupiter's enormous. There's an the enormous total, amount of energy. The total energy mm-hmm. is conserved. Total energy is sustained. Mm-hmm. So a, uh, a certain amount of energy given to the spacecraft makes a big difference in its motion. Spacecraft, much smaller than Jupiter. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, a very tiny, negligible, unmeasurable difference in the orbital energy of the planet. And so the whole idea for that is just this thing that when you're close to that object, the sun doesn't matter anymore. Right. And so you just plan your entry it's, into it's the gravitational sphere in of influence yeah. around the planet in such a way that's like, okay, I can use F equals MA, oh. or if you're Jim, a Lagrangian, <laughs> <laughs> to figure out exactly where I'm going to come out of gravi- of Jupiter's sphere, right. and then I'll be on the path <laughs> I want to be. So it's a, this beautiful thing. So that's for interplanetary stuff. What about astroquarks? If you want to change your orbit, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. you don't have a planet handy. So, for example, we're sending satellites up all the time. Yeah. We launch stuff to the International Space Station. And, you know, the thing leaves mm-hmm. down the road here, Kennedy. Mm-hmm. It's on some egg-shaped orbit. It needs to get up and match orbits mm-hmm. with the space station. Mm-hmm. Or you launch a communication satellite. Mm-hmm. starts off low. You need to get it up so it's 24-hour orbit or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Explain that one. <laughs> you just <laughs> didn't, didn't, weren't ready for that. Oh, were you? Explain that one. You use yeah. rockets on your spacecraft to do that. Engines. All right. So you once again have to uh, kind of change the energy. You're not changing the energy of the it's total system, of course. Yeah. But you're taking internal stored energy, chemical potential energy, and things like that, and mm-hmm. turning it into. Energy of motion, right? So that you can change your orbit. Well, one of the peculiar things about it that's somewhat counterintuitive is, is the higher you, you higher, are, you got to slow down. You end up going slower, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so this is uh, can become a point of confusion. So the geosynchronous satellites take twenty four hours to go around the Earth, mm-hmm. and low Earth orbit is like ninety minutes, hour and a half. Now, of course, it's a bigger circle up there, but their orbital speed is actually slower mm-hmm. at mm-hmm. those higher orbits. Mm-hmm. So you're slowing down. Yeah, the ISS down. orbit is about 90 minutes. It's like right. 89 or yeah. something, I think. Yeah. I think. People don't recognize that. It really whips around the Earth yeah. very quickly, yeah. entirely around the Earth in, I totally, in an hour and a half. I totally they recommend have... signing up for the yeah. alerts to see the ISS. You can mm-hmm. get yeah. an email or a text message from NASA. Um, I'll put the link on our Facebook and our website. You can um, sign up to get those links, uh, sorry, to get notices for when ISS will be visible to you locally, you just put your zip code in, yeah. and you get a, usually a day or sometimes same day. Mm-hmm. And it's always visible either just after dawn or, or sorry, just uh, before dawn or just after sunset because you only see it by reflected light. Yeah. yeah. So it's up there high enough for there's the sun also, to be shining on it, but the sky is dark enough. There's also some good like YouTube feeds that they have of live views from the station. A bunch of times. I was about to go on a crazy tangent. You Jim can yes. you can you can edit this out. If, Are you going to uh, go on a, it, a tangent to its orbit? <laughs> Uh, kind of. Mm. I just did recently see a sci-fi movie that I thought was, uh, I enjoyed the heck out of, I thought it was very interesting, it was Valerian and the, what is it called? Oh, City of a Thousand City Planets. City of a Thousand Planets, oh. or subtitle. Ever. I heard that that was a terrible so, movie. I right, heard, that's what everybody heard, that's what my, that's what, uh, Bottom Cork heard, which, uh-huh. which means that I didn't get to see it for quite some time. Oh, yeah. No. Um, but then but she, she was, was out of town the other day. <laughs> <laughs> and I took that opportunity to watch uh, Valerian. Because anyway, and, and you're right. This it wasn't is a Luc Besson. Is this, this a, yes, a, yes, yeah. uh, So, so I don't know. It wasn't the greatest plot, mm-hmm. necessarily greatest actors or anything Sold. like that. Sold. <laughs> I can't wait. But, but it was beautiful. It was okay. very. You know, it was, I did it was hear that it has lots of colors. It's, it it's got lots of colors. Cool it's got orbits? lots of great, uh, cool things. But and it had the, the 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 connection here is yes. Make the connection. The city of a thousand planets was the International Space Station. So that is the international because you know what they do at the international space station. It started off as a pretty small thing with a few little modules, right? Yes. And they add more and more modules in. True. Yes. With so like different that. countries contribute different modules Correct. and things like that. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. And yes. so they just took this to its natural conclusion that uh, you know that, that countries would keep adding this and it would get bigger and bigger, bigger, and then, and then eventually planet. aliens would discover aliens, and then they would come and add to the international space station, and this thing that was the ISS becomes this thing with a and thousand then it drops different out of civilizations. Orbit. <laughs> Then right. they then they have it. Uh, well, what they do is because it becomes it. it does become start to become a danger to Earth because it's yeah. so massive. So they uh, they shoot it off out of orbit. Yeah, and then they do. Then they really they upset me. That was uh, I thought mm-hmm. that was a cool idea. But then they upset me because then you know they they have people flying around 
you know, the episode. going <laughs> light years in minutes and stuff like that. And then they have this thing going for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years off into the deep space. And they, they say at one point something like, well, it's been going for all these years and now it's, it's a hundred million miles from Earth. <laughs> oh. Uh, is this going a million miles a year? Well, a uh, hundred, uh, that's in the solar system still. Right. Uh, it's supposed oh, to be yeah. like, oh, it's, an, it's supposed to, to be an know, interstellar space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. in any event, yeah, I it's still, a great movie. I still think it was a good movie. I enjoyed it. Okay. I, I would give it a okay. six out of ten. You were visually pleased. Six out, six of, six 10. out of ten. That's a pretty modest endorsement. Yeah. It's a modest, I mean, it's one of the greatest movie in the world, but right. it was pretty enough. I enjoyed it. Cool Great. enough. All right. Well, anyway, sorry. That's sorry. Gonna, no, that's good because it's going to get some of that stuff's going to get us to our trivia. But before we get yeah. to the trivia, I just want to finish up on the orbital changing stuff. Yes. Yeah. So while you have, while you end up going slower when you're at a higher orbit, yes. you don't get yourself going slower by slowing down. You mm-hmm. get yourself going slower by speeding up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. You're, yeah. You change it's, your delta V. Y- you have to, to fire, you, your you fire your engines to go forward, mm-hmm. which makes you go higher, mm-hmm. which makes you go slower. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is actually really cool. Right. Nice. So while you're. Isn't it? Did you guys you're see thrusting, hidden figures? <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> did you guys see hidden figures? Yes. Isn't there a scene? Isn't there a scene in this movie where they're like drawing on the chalkboard and they're like, oh, you have to do this Delta V, blah, blah, blah. And it was like the first time they'd heard of it. And I was like, I think they knew about this already. Yeah. Anyway. In the 60s, they already knew. But uh, yeah, so it's an it's this odd thing. You, yeah, you use your is, yeah. stored chemical energy to mm-hmm. do something. And while you're doing that, you're not orbiting, really. You're, no, right. you're changing you have this your other orbit thing. that time. Then when you're done... Now you're on some new orbit. Mm-hmm. It's kind of the same thing as when you're getting the gravity assist, you're not really orbiting the sun. Right. You're interacting with Jupiter or Venus or mm-hmm. Mars or whatever. Mm-hmm. Then when you come out, and so while you're firing your engines, you're not really orbiting the Earth anymore. You're doing some thing where you're disturbing the the natural order of the Lagrangian <laughs> or the Keplerian <laughs> or the Hamiltonian. But, like, changing those <clears throat> orbits does require a lot of fuel, and that's why, like – so I actually just saw that the Kepler mission – um, paused at science collection to uh, send a bunch of data back because they're almost out of fuel. Yeah. And so, like, to do any of their pos- – even, like, positioning for Kepler has to do – you have to use fuel to do that, I think. Right. And so they maybe only have, like, one science data collection phase left. Yeah, but all of these missions, like – most of the mass of what you send up is called wet mass, right? So it's mm. the mass of the fuel that you have to do either to launch it and then to get it into wet the orbit mass. you want. That's kind of awesome. I've yeah, so dry mass is the spacecraft and mass, 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 and wet yeah. mass is like all the fuel. The wet mass is the mess that's left over after <laughs> oh. a party. <laughs> <laughs> but that, but oftentimes in launches, most of the mass is wet mass. The wet mass, man, I had to clean up a really nasty wet mass. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to uh, this is going to devolve derailed. quickly. Yeah. Let me just say, I was going to call. We are dropping out of orbit <laughs> fast <laughs> at this point. To clean up the wet mass myself. <laughs> okay, so before we get into all the stuff about asteroids, let me drop the trivia on it because it relates to something Addy said about wet Jim's mass? thing about the Valerian thing. Oh. Okay, There's it relates of- to a thing about oh. a thing about a thing. <laughs> yeah. No way. T- trivia today is related to orbital mechanics. So there's been a theme here, and to orbital decay, which mm. is what we're talking about. Build a big space station. Already, our space station. If we just left it alone. It's coming down. It's coming down. But that's it, because. Not because of anything orbital mechanics, but because it's interacting with it's the Earth's still, very high upper atmosphere right. and thus a little bit of friction, so it slows down. Right. Which means it falls. But on, on – pick your time scale, orbits change because there's not you, – you said on a, a recent episode – you can solve the two-body gravitational problem. As right. soon as there's something else going on, yeah. it's just all bets are off. Yeah. Two-body and gravitational problem, way easier to solve than the two-body problem. This is true. Uh, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. <laughs> uh, but even or light not. from the star changes mm-hmm. the orbit of things. Right. It's mm-hmm. pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Anyway, this is related to – today's trivia is related to orbital mechanics, and as you remember, it's orbital historical. Oh. Uh, so this is related to orbital mechanics, or at least mechanical stuff, in orbit. What it's very simple. Mm-hmm. What satellite or spacecraft has been in space the longest? Ooh! Wow, that's a beautiful, simple, difficult question. I think this may a future trivia question will be: What was the shortest trivia question Josh ever asked? And it <laughs> that's probably true. be this they, one. They typically have a significant <laughs> <Many>. preamble. <laughs> this one did not. Yeah, uh, it's multiple choice oh. for you guys. Oh, okay. oh. Oh, this yeah. the, may be the easiest uh, trivia question <laughs> I was either. Prepared to uh, okay, yeah. Okay. No, I figure for this, yeah, it's got to be multiple choice. What no, satellite or spacecraft has been in space the longest? Okay, Sputnik two, okay, Vanguard one, Explorer one, Pioneer four, or Luna one. Wow. So 
That's a spacecraft that's in space still. Still in space. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily in contact with us. In fact, they aren't. I'll go ahead and tell you now. None of of those those are. Is in contact with us now. But uh, some, (laughs) some or all, may still be in space. And one of them has been in space longer than any of the others and longer than any other thing. So that's the trivia Hmm. question for that. (laughs) Hey. Hey. Speaking of space. That's what we talk about. (laughs) What Uh, a great transition. Speaking of orbits. Right. Asteroids and comets have orbits. There you go. So there's a new paper. (laughs) That get changed by Jupiter sometimes. I hope we don't lose listeners because of this episode. (laughs) When I I say that, (laughs) it's just because, like, of all of the courses that you have to take, like, as an undergraduate astronomy major or something like this, Mm -hmm. orbital mechanics... It's got to be, like, the least popular, right? Really? Like, when we have courses here, routinely, students will come up and say, I wish you guys offered a course in X. Well, right? that's always, like, black holes, because it's like, I'm super interested yeah, in Yeah, they want to see that. But, but but our planetary science, people want to learn about mm-hmm. various things. But orbital mechanics is, unless you're the biggest nerd, and, and don't get me wrong, I love you if you're the biggest nerd, because we're all the biggest nerds, but orbital mechanics is never one that's requested. We actually don't have an undergraduate orbital mechanics course here. No. The closest we have is my class. graduate class. Yeah. Right. Right. Some and mix this, of classical the in your class. students love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's mostly because yes, it's, it's challenging yes, and a lot of math and whatever. But That laughter was <laughs> ironic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a, I liked that class when I took it. Yeah. I guess it, it's... it's you didn't take it, it, it from it could, me. But I didn't take it from Josh. <laughs> no. Unfortunately, I did not get to take it from Josh. Uh, there's a new paper by our colleague Stan Dermott at University of Florida mm-hmm. and uh, Tom Kehoe and others about the origin of asteroids. So, uh, asteroids you get from sitting on the toilet too long. No, sorry. Oh, wow. That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can cut that one out. <laughs> Asteroids. I got uh-huh. it. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Asteroids are leftover building blocks of planets. True. Yep. And uh, therefore interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the, I guess over the course of the last 20 or 30 years, We've learned that many of the asteroids in what's called the main belt, mm-hmm. uh, the asteroid main belt, most of the asteroids are between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it was discovered that a lot of those asteroids have very similar orbits to each other. So like be yeah. a, some mm-hmm. grouping of asteroids that all have those same letters I was mentioning earlier uh, the, that the Tisserand sponsor gave us, mm-hmm. A, E, and I, which is the size of the orbit, the shape of the orbit, and the mm-hmm. orientation of the orbit. So you would see. So people who do study orbital dynamics and yes, learn interesting those things big about nerds them. That Jim loves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they would study the. They would look at say, hey, there's 113 asteroids that all have almost the same A, E, and I. Yeah. And then, even, and more recently, they would do these really sophisticated computer simulations where they backtrack their orbits backwards mm-hmm. in time and find that as they go backwards in time, the A's, E's, and I's get even more similar, and right. they not only have the same shape size and orientation but the individual rocks end up like at the same place at the yeah. same time right at presto mm-hmm. that presto all those things are probably debris from, from something some that got smashed one original object yeah, yeah. so it's, it's, it's a parent body right yeah and it's interesting too because a lot of the people so these so they call these groups of asteroids families because they're broken up from like an original parent body right so we like that sort of nomenclature shouldn't there um, be two original parent bodies no that's a very narrow view jim <laughs> How? Sorry, I, I'm not trying to be unwoke. So, but like, if you have, if you have, if you have uh, one, I think that's called a sleep. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you have one big thing that gets busted up, and it gets busted up usually by another big thing. Yeah, but I mean, that's true. That's awesome. True. Oh, I'm right. That's true. in, like, if you're thinking of, but 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 the, usually the 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 one thing of those doing is, the busting be much up bigger than the other. Yeah, so okay. they, the parent body is the main thing that existed. So like when the moon formed from the earth there was a little other thing that hit us but the earth formed and then the moon formed and there so was So we say a little, a little other thing but uh like I Mars thought size. it was something like Mars size. So if you had debris from that collision, sure, but a majority up, of it will be earthy stuff or whatever. But that's for earth. It was but, a bad example. Uh, but, but for the, to break up an asteroid, like a standard run-of-the-mill asteroid, since like the collision speeds are – Yeah, like Vesta. The collision speeds are high enough that the, to break it up, mm-hmm. it can be much, much smaller mm-hmm. than the thing that's getting broken up. Sure. And chances it are, can of be. Course, 
Yeah, and the likelihood is is that it will it, it be. It will be, because and there are much, so many more smaller things. Right, than yeah. very things. unlikely to have a collision of like-sized objects. You're very likely to have a collision of things that are much different in size. Mm-hmm. And if the energy is high enough, the they're, of course, care. both going to get destroyed, but most of the stuff is, from is coming the from the big parent, thing. Okay. which the is just body. like actual parents, right, if you think about it. There's one parent that's much more important than the other in that whole process of producing the babies. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, right? it's true. Yeah. Most There's the, just the, one the small ma- thing that comes in and breaks everything just up. One small contribution <laughs> <laughs> the female, initially, and the then fem- throughout the rest of the, the it's just child's spiritual life, support it's, after uh, that. But no. the the uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so there's a parent body that gets broken up into lots of smaller bodies, that and then works. sperm breaks up the egg. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Is that how it works? <laughs> it breaks up here. I never, I never got the birds and the bees. Well, so. The- <laughs> Oh, so that's not what this podcast I just, I just is about, Jim. I learned something today. That's right, not anyway, what this podcast on, I'm, is I'm about. I'm convinced that you know uh, what the man, You know what the man's physical contribution is, right, Jim? And then you know a baby comes out at the end. And the baby is much bigger than the man's contribution. What? <laughs> <laughs> Mind blown. Anyway, parent bodies. Parent body. Okay. So, so first, a... let me welcome our listeners back from the 15 <laughs> minutes that have just been edited out of this podcast. <laughs> um, so there's a parent body that's gets broken up gets and and then over time right the little bits get spread out in different orbits because they have different solar radiation pressure on them they're different sizes they have different collisions of their own all of this stuff <laughs> and the thing i find fascinating right is that like the people who just determine this are the dynamicists the people who do the orbital dynamics and then what we try to do is have the people who do spectroscopy and observational uh, measurements of these bodies like actually looking at the surfaces try to match those bodies up say like oh do those families all have the same spectral characteristics or are they actually different have they evolved differently in their lifetimes Mm -hmm. and it's pretty interesting because most of the time i think spectrally they're similar but sometimes you get big big variations and then what people try to do is they try to match like meteorites to those parent bodies and there i think you should stop because it's, Very different processes happening up in space than it would yeah. have happened since it's come to the ground. Well, that's why they, that's why these asteroid sample return missions are really important, important too. Yeah. Uh, you go, you get the, you get the stuff off the asteroid before anything has happened to it, like crashing through the Earth's atmosphere and landing in Antarctica or wherever. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. But there's this new article. Yeah. So there are lots of these families that we've known about. And so then you say, okay, in the main belt, there's, Family asteroids, and then there's all these other asteroids that don't necessarily seem to be family mm-hmm. asteroids. So the new paper takes a look at the characteristics of all the asteroids in the main belt, and they find some statistical correlations. Uh, Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I love a good statistical correlation. The non-family asteroids. So mm-hmm. these background or I, I don't know what you call them. They're loners. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, so anytime you Sociopaths. see these plots, there's oh gosh, <laughs> yeah, the, they're not the sociopaths. family asteroids and hermits, <laughs> right? Or that's better than sociopaths. Sociopath. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, oh, just anytime you see these plots of like the families, there's these clusters, and there's lots of other things too, that right? Because if you just sort of clustered. glance at it, you might be like, oh, there's just a lot of stuff everywhere, yeah. but you sort of see little groupings. Yes. Yeah. So they took a look at the non-family asteroids. And found mm-hmm. that the sizes of the non-family asteroids in the inner part of the main belt are correlated with E, the shape of the orbit, how egg-shaped it is, and anti-correlated with I, the inclination or the orientation mm-hmm. of the orbit, suggesting that both the non-family asteroids and the family asteroids are uh, the byproducts of some small number of uh, large, er, obviously, parent bodies or primordial uh, objects, they estimate that um, 85% of the inner main belt of the asteroid belt originates from five families, and the other 15% uh, come from a couple others or something. So they're basically saying most of the asteroid belt, hmm. even if it's not apparently in the inner belt, the inner mm-hmm. part of the main belt of asteroids, even if it's not apparently part of these five families, which have names, they're named after like the biggest Vesta. asteroid. In they're that. Vestoi, Vesta, Flora, Vesta, uh, some other the, ones, Nisa, Polana, and Eulalia, Eulalia, which is the funnest to say. <laughs> um, that uh, even if they're not apparently from those, that huh. they probably are. Apparently, apparently. yeah. 
uh, <laughs> that they probably are. So that uh, something like 85% of the Which is way higher. Originally, yeah. it was like half of them maybe were in these families and the rest were sort of scattered. Right. So that, two thoughts. One, that's very interesting, right? Of course, because that tells us a lot instead of... That's why we're talking about it. Yeah. Because uh, typically when you're teaching this at intro level, so you, I mean, you, or, or whatever, you just think of... Asteroids is leftover stuff from the inner solar system. It just never made it to be planets or right. planetesimals. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the just, IKEA parts that yeah, right, after you finish right. putting your bookcase together, you still, still have, have three one. screws and four wooden pegs right. and a bracket. Right. And the, so this is <laughs> suggesting that those things were never, yeah, that, that those things were actually part of a bigger object yeah. that did break up so that mm-hmm. most yeah. of the stuff in the solar system did make it to be reasonably large planetesimals, then just got broken up later. Yeah. Yeah. And it throws a little bit of a monkey wrench this whole idea of like, <laughs> oh, let's go get a piece of an asteroid. It tells us all the stuff about a primitive, mm-hmm. unaltered, right. untouched thingy. Mm-hmm. But... My How second thought them? is, I don't think I buy this. <gasps> oh. uh, not because I don't like, I mean, uh, uh, Stan Dermott like and, uh, and Kehoe. I mean, you these are, these are UF. smart folks and I know I did go to UF. Uh, though I did not know, uh, Stan, yeah, I was in the physics department at the UF uh, and had surprisingly little contact with the astronomy department, even though I was doing a, an astrophysics PhD. But in any event, um, I don't know. You don't, don't believe know. it? I don't know. Why? So for one, the composition of meteorites, and of course the surface properties of meteorites would be radically different from anything just because of what you just said. Mm-hmm. But the composition of the astro- uh, the meteorites don't seem to, I don't know. But like I'm if not, they were. That's not a satisfying but, conclusion. That's not a satisfying that conclusion. Yeah, I, so, I, I, so I'm trailing of off. Things, but I mean, I, yeah. Where do, I mean, many of those are, are these primitive things that have clearly not been, not been differentiated, you know, not, right. are, we're not part of a very large thing. They might have been part of a larger, you know, thing, but not a, very right. large, but maybe. Plant. But I mean, these things aren't going to be very large. They're still going to be smaller than like the moon, I think. Right. So you maybe don't even get differentiation. So differentiation again is where you have something large enough that like it separates out, and you get like an it, iron layer and a. It's, it's so rocky massive. Layer. It's that right. it gets molten, molten in the interior and, the, and the, density right. separates. But like maybe it doesn't get big enough for that, right? Yeah. You can have like we know that a lot of asteroids and other objects are rubble piles, right? They're big, sort of cohesive things. Right. But those are hard to form. And keep together. So I don't know how you form these things either. Yeah. I don't know. It's complicated. I don't know. It's, 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 it sheds new light. It's, it's interesting. The early solar system, which is something that uh, Josh and Eddie, to some extent, uh, work on, it's hard. Because yeah. you can't go back there and see I what was it was say, like. We don't jump in our time machines. Right. And- but that right. does lead us to kind of our next uh, topic, which seeing, is... Seeing planets form around other planets. So let's take a crack at your trivia before oh, yeah. we touch base with that. Okay. So, okay. as you okay. recall, it's logic multiple through choice. This one. Mm-hmm. I don't think I can logic through it. What I'm going to take a random spacecraft? guess, but you could probably logic through it. What satellite or spacecraft has been in space the longest? Okay. Sputnik 2, Vanguard 1, Explorer 1, Pioneer 4, or Luna 1? Why do you specify satellite or spacecraft? Uh, because it doesn't necessarily need to be orbiting the Earth. Okay. Satellite implies it's orbiting the Earth. Spacecraft right. implies it's not right. necessarily. Although spacecraft, sp- satellites are spacecraft, but space not all spacecrafts are satellites. I didn't want to use one of those words, which would then make you think, okay, okay. it's it. not that Got one it. because that one's a satellite, not a spacecraft or vice, vice versa. Okay. Right. Right. Now, yeah, yeah. Man. All right, can you read them again? For an easy trivia <laughs> question, you guys are giving me a hard time. Well, you gotta make, we gotta make some big deal Sputnik out of it. Sputnik 2, Vanguard 1, Explorer 1, Pioneer 4, or Luna 1. Yeah. And there will be bonus trivia props for after. <sighs> Very challenging. So I can get a, uh, okay. an answer. Uh, challenging for me. Uh, maybe less so for Eddie. Eddie knows a lot about spacecraft. She loves rockets and Let's spacecraft an and so forth. I'm going with, I'm gonna get, because I don't know, I'll go first. Yes. I'll okay. guess Luna 1. Um, Pioneer 4. You are both wrong. Yeah. Oh. So wait, let's logic this out a second. Okay. Okay. So Sputnik 2, I'm pretty sure it's not that one. It is not Sputnik 2. All so right. your logic is actually process of elimination. Because Sputnik 2, <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. No, so Sputnik <laughs> 2 was, Guessing each Sputnik one and 2 say, was the one that had Leica. Is it this one? No. Sput- okay, Sputnik is it this 2 one? had Leica, right? <laughs> Did it? I think that's so. That's one with a dog? I think so. Oh, I'm sorry I even listed it. Yeah. Is that true? Mm-hmm. Let's not talk about that. Uh, yeah, Sputnik 2 was the one. Was, okay. Um, and then after that, so then Explorer 1 was our like first really successful uh, rocket launch, basically. Right. And it was a satellite. And it, is that the right answer? 
No. Okay, I didn't think so. Because, oh, because it was, we've got it, was it super then. early. <laughs> we but that was, four. But that was to study But that was to study the Van Allen belts. radiation belts. Right. Nice. Right? And it was our first really successful one. Did I, it orbit or was it uh, suborbital? Very high altitude suborbital. I'm, I actually don't know. I don't I know that. if it orbited. Yeah. That's anyway, why I didn't think it was that the one. The answer by logic is slash Vanguard? process of elimination is Vanguard 1. I didn't one. think Vanguard... It's still in orbit. And it was launched... March 17th, 1958. Wow. First solar-powered satellite, fourth ever launched. So this is launched by the U.S.? Uh, mm-hmm. By the yeah. U.S. Uh, Luna 1, which was... That was Russian, my guess. That guess, was Russian. Was launched uh, yeah. in January of 70, uh, 59. Oh, that was pretty Pioneer close. Pioneer 4, they were both lunar missions. Pioneer 4 was also, was launched in March of 59. What happened to it? I think they're still up there in space. Just, just have not been up okay. there as long. Are those See, things, are those things in, in a lunar orbit? No, they're no, in Earth orbit. They're in Earth orbit. They're, they're in Earth, Earth orbit. orbit. Uh, and those two that were destination moon had some moon flyby of sorts. Okay. So uh, here's some fun facts. Vanguard 1 was launched March 17th, 1958. Yo, so Day. it was after, yeah, so Sputnik 2 Explorer and then Vanguard, yeah. Whereas, it was like Sputnik the order of one, Sputnik well, two, yeah. Explorer, Explorer one, Vanguard one. Yeah. Uh, first solar powered satellite, fourth satellite ever launched. Initial orbit six fifty four by four thousand kilometers, roughly. Oh wow! A big egg shaped orbit. Mm-hmm. So your bonus trivia, Ooh. and it relates to what you were saying about the space station, what Ooh. you were saying about Valerian, the city of a million colors, uh-huh. <laughs> is how long before Vanguard one deorbits? Deorbits. What was its initial orbit? 654 by 3969. What's but its th- current orbit? Units. Know. Kilometers. K- kilometers. Thanks. Um, a long time. Well, so 654 is pretty, it's, it's probably closer now. It's probably like 500 something now. I don't know. I don't know. Don't look, don't look at me with those dove eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a really cool thing that I want to figure out better is do some of this modeling, like what, how, what yeah. space, because for right. our CubeSats, right, we have to know what orbital decay it's, rates are. I want a number of In years. 40 years from now. 500 years. Um, I'm going to give it on going logarithmically to Addy. 240 years. <laughs> okay. Okay. Two, okay. Yeah, um, she wins. Yeah. So uh, when they first launched it, they thought it would be thousands, but then they hit, realized they had forgotten to take into account things like solar cycles and solar oh, radiation yeah. pressure, stuff like that. Oh. Anyway, cool. So our our last little we'll, we'll uh, just say a couple of words about the last topic because um, it's got a cool pick associated with it. We can post on our website. Yes, uh, we uh, we're, oh, yeah, it does. we've talked a lot about searches for extrasolar planets and the mm-hmm. Kepler mission, and now there are some amazing capabilities from ground based telescopes to look at forming planetary systems around other stars using the Alma. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, telescope in Chile, and uh, they look in infrared wavelengths, so they're seeing the glow from uh, the disk of junk around a star and dust. the planets forming. They're and so now dust. there's a, a discovery, like direct imaging mm-hmm. of a planet as it's forming. Uh, and they, I guess the 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 clue is it's it's hotter than it should be if it's just like shining from. Starlight, right? Mm-hmm. Still, right. it's got this extra glow from the energy being released by it accreting, right? Like from recent formation, right? Yeah. yeah, onto it heats it up, and it's so it's got this extra glow. How hot is it, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> That's something we were laughing about before. Yeah, we don't know, but oh yes, uh, we do. Oh, they have some estimates. We know well, right, it to right. four we have a range. significant digits. <laughs> so how do so we get the temperature based I on know how hot it is? This imaging is in infrared. Right. So we look right? at we look at this in, in several different wavelengths of light. Mm-hmm. We match it to the physics, which says something of, of of a certain temperature has a spectrum that looks like this or that or the other thing. And so, uh, in the actual science paper that was written about, I say science, the uh, uh, peer reviewed journal article, yes, right. Not they give a temperature says be- somewhere between eleven hundred and fifty and thirteen hundred and fifty Kelvin. Okay, right, and uh, of course, which, so they give a two hundred. A 200 Kelvin, Kelvin temperature range, temperature which is, range, a, that's a which is reasonable. That's, reasonable. A, that's a pretty good job to be able to narrow it down. That's that's pretty warm. Uh, in, but uh, in in the article on the, in for, the for popular media, the Earth is about 300 Kelvin. 300 Kelvin, right? Burr. <laughs> right. So this is actually <laughs> very chilly. very warm. 
planet, right. which is actually kind of uh, you know, like I said, it's this is the reason why I think it's still forming. We're it's it's actually it very it's far away from its star. It's it's, it's a, like the, the distance, distance of Uranus, Uranus right, right. Uh, from its star. So obviously, give it enough time, and its surface will cool down significantly. It's, right. it's very far away from mm-hmm. the star. Um, but we were just laughing because uh, the in the popular release. so in the Pressler thing, it says researchers were able to determine that it's a gas giant planet and has a blisteringly hot surface temperature of one thousand eight hundred and thirty two degrees Fahrenheit. Right. That's so precise. Which is precise <laughs> to the science. degree, right? When they gave a two hundred <laughs> Kelvin, yeah. uh, that's like precise paper. to the half a degree Kelvin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It also says in that article that the planet looks close to its star. It's actually uh, one billion, uh, one trillion eight hundred sixty four million one or billion. <laughs> One hundred thirteen thousand five hundred seventy-six miles away. Right, seventy-six miles <laughs> yeah, away. To the, and of course, yes. the, that's the same distance as Uranus. See, from this, our is sun. A tra- this is such, such a troubling thing. This is why we <laughs> really wish that there were more people out there who were interested in communicating science well to the public, mm-hmm. right? Because right. clearly, this is a, a a reporter who doesn't really know science very well, doesn't understand you know uncertainties and things like that, and so they and they had some number in kilometers and transformed it into miles, and they had some rough estimate well, the, in Kelvin and transformed that the, into right. Fahrenheit and then just used all of the digits yeah. uh, the, in their calculator and put it in there. Well, the the distance, of course, it's incredibly difficult to measure the distance. You're measuring yeah. the, the, you're looking at a star yeah. and looking at something that's orbiting that star mm-hmm. from a very, very great distance. Mm-hmm. Yes. So that their distance measurement is sort of at the level of a few astronomical units is yeah. the precision, yeah. which means... They're they're able to say it's about twenty times further from the star than Which the is Earth sort of is. Similar to Uranus, plus distance. or minus a couple of those, and each one of those is hundred million miles. Right. So they're like plus or minus a hundred million miles, and the answer is to the mile. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And so yeah, this Sorry. is one of those things that 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 scientists get very their makes their skin crawl when they see things like this. But uh, yeah, the general public probably doesn't care so much. It's and it's really you know in the grand scheme. Yeah, this obviously is not, this that's is way way down in the list. <laughs> of uh, scientific sins. Right. That's true. So, uh, well, while you may be thinking that by now, Vanguard 1 must surely have crashed. (laughs) It's only been another episode of Walk About the Galaxy. Be sure to like us on Facebook to get all our updates and check out our website at walkaboutthegalaxy.com where you can also see some of our past sponsors. Follow us on Twitter at walk underscore the underscore galaxy where you can ask us questions and suggest topics that you'd like to hear us discuss. Our theme music was composed by Richard Jerusik. Catch up on old episodes wherever you get your podcasts and write us a review on your body and Snapchat it to your ex. (laughs) Oof. (laughs) I'm Josh Caldwell. I'm Addie Dove. And I'm Jim Cooney. We're the Astroquarks. That's us. Signing off until the next episode of Walk About the Galaxy. (laughs) 